Hello and welcome to the overview of the lecture on hematological function. This will cover the first two pages of the class notes. In the first part, uh, we will cover anemias. Then in the first part of class, we're going to cover anemias. And then in the second part of class, we're going to talk about uh, clotting and bleeding disorders. We're going to split it up a little bit because a lot of the clotting information uh, fits in really well with something we're going to talk about later in the pulmonary section. And so I say clotting, but mostly the disorders we'll talk about are where clotting doesn't work and we're focusing on the bleeding part of things and then we'll get to the clotting part later. All right, but before we get to any of that, we're going to see the overview of how we make some of these cells. Remember this? This is from the chapter on inflammation and immunity. We talked about hematopoiesis, that's the formation of blood cells. This happens in the bone marrow, of course. Um, and we saw, you know, there were two main lines, the lymphoid line that gave rise to all those lymphocytes and the myeloid line that gave rise to a lot of the cells of inflammation. But down here, these are the ones we're gonna focus on now, the erythrocytes. The term that's used for forming erythrocytes specifically is erythropoiesis. It's a fancy word, it just means making red blood cells. Uh, the blood, those red blood cells have two main functions, um, and that is transporting oxygen and a little bit transporting carbon dioxide. Uh, but mostly we talk about the transporting of oxygen. And so the major trigger for producing um, more red blood cells is actually having low levels of oxygen in the blood. Okay, so this is a little bit funny. Um, the trigger for making more red blood cells is a hormone uh, given the name uh, erythropoietin because it triggers making red blood cells. This is the weird part. It's mostly made in the kidneys. There is a little bit that's made in the liver, uh, but for the most part, we count on the kidneys to detect the oxygen levels and to produce this hormone and release it at appropriate times. Why oxygen is detected in the kidneys and why this is released from the kidneys, we don't know, um, but that is the fact. Uh, so you will find that your patients who have kidney disorders may be low on their red blood cells because their kidneys aren't producing adequate amounts of erythropoietin. This is the, the, the process. Um, so what we're seeing here is that the kidneys are detecting um, a low oxygen level. So the, the body's experiencing hypoxia detected in the kidneys that's gonna trigger the kidneys to release this hormone, erythropoietin. Now, it's released into the bloodstream, which means all the cells of the body get exposed to erythropoietin, but the only cells that are gonna to respond to that are in the bone marrow. Those are the ones that are the, the targets, the ones that have receptors for erythropoietin. And so that's gonna cause those cells uh, to increase activity in the bone marrow and produce and release a bunch more red blood cells. Well, what's supposed to happen then um, is we increase red blood cell production. That's going to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And then you get this negative feedback system. So if you increase uh, oxygen carrying capacity, then you no longer have renal hypoxia and the kidneys stop making the signal. This is working exactly the way it's supposed to work. And so you can imagine um, if somebody is living here in uh, New Mexico, um, and we have some hikes and we have some places that we go out and we have plenty of oxygen available for us. But then let's say we go to higher altitudes, either in New Mexico, or maybe we went to Colorado where there's lots higher mountains. Um, we go hiking in the Rockies and we're up at higher elevations. There's still, you know, about 21% oxygen in the air, but there's just a lot less air available for us. And we start feeling a little hypoxic. So what we experience is that we don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity anymore. 
Um, that's going to cause our kidneys to release erythropoietin and our bone marrow over the course of several days will respond by making uh, red blood cells and releasing more red blood cells into, into circulation. This is why athletes sometimes go to the training centers in Colorado at higher elevations to get themselves some more oxygen carrying capacity. And remember what all that oxygen is for is for cellular respiration, for making a lot more ATP, for paying for all the work that our muscles have to do and all the, the work that all the cells of the body have to do. Sometimes athletes are tempted to take a shortcut. Don't go to Colorado, just inject some erythropoietin. And that is known as blood doping. It's one way of blood doping and it's not recommended. It's not legal. Um, in most athletics. Um, but that's the, the whole idea of all of this is this is the, the signal. It causes the body to make some more red blood cells, which allows the body to carry more oxygen and increase aerobic capacity. All right, now there are problems that can arise. This is a pathophysiology class, that's why we're here. So we're gonna talk about these problems. As we've said, we can have a problem uh, making erythropoietin if the patient has renal problems or there are some disorders, one we're gonna talk about in class is called aplastic anemia, where the bone marrow is not gonna be making the, the blood cells properly. Or the simpler problem and much more common problem is that you know, the signal went out and the signal is responded to, but we're not able to make as many red blood cells as we need because we've got some problem, either making the hemoglobin or copying um, the, the DNA and making the cells. And um, if we can't make enough oxygen carrying capacity, we say the patient is anemic. And we'll talk about different ways in which we see uh, anemia develop. There are, let's see, we're gonna talk about uh, some more about red blood cells. Um, so to make red blood cells, one of the things that we have to make a lot of is this protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has four uh, big uh, uh, amino acid chains as part of it. Um, and the most common problem in making red blood cells is being able to produce this molecule. Uh, the red blood cells are fantastic big beautiful sacks of hemoglobin. It's just chock full of these proteins. And if you can't make these proteins, you're gonna have trouble making red blood cells. All right, so let's look at the structure a little bit. There's the globin part of the molecule. Uh, I'm gonna remind you of some biology over here on the left. What we're looking at is a chain of amino acids you know, that's what all proteins are made out of, these long strands of amino acids. Then those long strands of amino acids get folded up um, and twisted and bound to each other. And you get second tertiary and quaternary level structures. We're not gonna go into all those details right now. Um, what I want you to see is that once you have the quaternary structure, you've got this four-parted hemoglobin um, these molecules just kind of float around inside this red blood cell. There is at the kind of at the heart of each of these uh, protein chains is a thing called a heme group. That's the part that actually binds the oxygen. So yes, it's important. You have to make the protein, but even if you make the protein, if you can't make the heme group, and specifically if you don't have the iron that goes in the middle of that heme group, you're still not gonna have oxygen carrying capacity. And we'll talk about that more in class. Let me show you, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, so this is where the name comes from. The protein part of things, the big four things, those are the globular proteins. That's where the globin part of the name comes from. And then um, the iron is attached to something called a heme group. And you put those two things together and we get hemoglobin. So let me show you that heme group. Uh, we're not gonna test you on the structure of this though. What I wanted to show you though, was that um, it's a, a, an organic compound at the center of it is an iron atom. That's the Fe, uh, represents iron. 
that is the atom that actually binds the oxygen. In the absence of this iron, even if you made every last bit of everything else, you're still not gonna be able to carry the oxygen. And so that's why this thing is so important. So we're gonna look at how to measure hemoglobin in class. It's one of the ways we assess for anemia. Um, and we're gonna take a closer look at iron physiology, both um, the fact that we have to get it in our diets, um, but also absorption of the iron, storage of the iron, transferring of the iron from one part of the body to another. And before we go on to this last topic, I just wanted to point out, um, so we'll talk about um, the hemoglobin, um, but then this very last line on page one, um, there are some genetic and autoimmune conditions that affect the red blood cell lifespan. So even if you are able to make the hemoglobin and you are able to make uh, the, the red blood cells properly, um, or our patients are able to do these things, there are some disorders that lead to the destruction of those red blood cells. And we'll talk about those because those can also lead to anemias. Okay, and now we're gonna switch gears and go to talking about the clotting issues. And what I need you to know about this going into class, um, the term for clotting is hemostasis, hemo blood stasis, static, staying in place. Um, this whole process is activated by damaging the blood vessels in some way. We've seen this diagram before. This is figure six, four from that chapter on it, um, inflammation and immunity. And oops, see. Um, I wanna draw your attention here to the center of it. Um, what we're seeing here is a bunch of platelets adhering. There's um, been some opening in the, blood, in the blood vessel. And so platelets are adhering. That's certainly part of uh, clotting. But then there's also, if you look closely, there are some uh, blue fibers. We've seen these before out here. Um, when we were talking about inflammation, we saw them in the tissues um, because some of the proteins that are needed for making them come from the, the, the bloodstream and they leak out and, and this is what we were using to corral the, the infectious agents and corral the white blood cells to the area to tackle those infectious agents. But we actually do use fibrin inside the blood vessels um, to close up the holes. And uh, let's see how we get to make fibrin is this beautifully intricate uh, cascade of a bunch of different proteins that interact with each other. The end product of this clotting system is down here, this fibrin protein. And there's a couple of ways of getting here. Um, without going into a lot of detail, let me say this. There are proteins that are made by the liver. And we, we, talked about some of these protein systems before. Um, some of them are related to immunity or uh, inflammation and immunity. We talked about the coagulate, sorry, the complement cascade. But then there was also the clotting cascade. Um, the proteins related to the clotting cascade are referred to as factors. I don't know why, but what we call them historically, we call them factors, they're numbered with Roman numerals. Um, Having defective proteins of any of these, of any of these, it turns out there's 13 of them. Um, if any of them are defective because there's a genetic mutation, for example, we actually have trouble getting, getting to this grand finale of making the fibrin. So we're going to talk about what some of those disorders are um, that can lead to dis, um, dysfunction of these proteins and, and lead to a problem making the fibrin. And as you can imagine, if you don't have this fibrin, you're gonna have trouble clotting and these, these patients have bleeding disorders. Okay, this is a different representation of the same thing. The grand finale, once again, is fibrin. We're gonna work backwards. I've mentioned this before, a bunch of these proteins have to be in circulation already. If they're not in circulation, already in the inactivated form, 
you're never going to make a clot. But we also don't want them to be activated by accident. Otherwise, you're making a clot where you don't need one. Um, and so these proteins have to be present in the inactivated form and they wait to get activated by the protein before them in the cascade. So first you trigger this by the extrinsic pathway, um, damage to the inside, or sorry, damage to the, the blood vessel, exposing something that's typically outside the blood vessel. That's why it's called the extrinsic pathway. Um, this involves some, there's some platelet activation, but there are a bunch of different proteins. Let's see, this is shown here on this diagram on this side, the extrinsic uh, pathway. We, yeah, with, I'm not gonna go into a lot of, there's a bunch of different proteins. They're numbered Roman numerals um, and both pathways come down to factor 10. Once factor 10 is activated, uh, the little a's just mean an activated version of that protein. Um, that's the last step before you trigger the second to last protein. And then finally you trigger the last protein to make fibrin. Fibrin allows us, um, as we said, we can see it out here outside of the blood vessel, but inside the blood vessel, it helps us to stabilize a blood clot. Um, it forms something like a network, a net, a cage, if you will, and it captures platelets and it captures red blood cells and it allows them to, to stick and form a plug that like, physically covers up this hole in the blood vessel and that's how we keep blood from leaking out. So in class, we will uh, start off with some questions about hematological function overview on these first two pages, and then we will get into anemia, and then we will get into the bleeding disorders. So I'll see you in class. <laughs>